four. Do you have a gardening problem? We can help you with that. A program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make that grass look a little bit greener, as well as preserving what you grow. We're here to help you with your gardening problem. You're tuned in to Garden Talk Radio. You're listening to the most informational packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the Internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project and projects, visit powerplanter.com. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us to talk gardening for the next hour. Whether you're listening to us through your radio on one of the 16 stations, our show is being broadcast through North America here in 2020 on a radio app through our website, which is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com or uh, under the season four tab at the top of the page in studio video or podcast replay. We thank you. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend and gardening partner, Holly Baird. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener, as well as preserving what you grow all indoors and out. You can get a hold of us several different ways. One is through email. You can email us at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. And you can send us a tweet at using hashtag TWVG. You can also give us a call anytime, day or night, 24-7 at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-SHOW. Talking about the show here, we are going to talk about in segment one, eight bugs you definitely want in your garden. In segment two, we're going to talk about gardening with pets and uh, the benefits that they provide for us owners. And then we'll have guest and author Linda Lee will be with us, plus answering your garden questions. So let's get in the program and talk about bugs that we want in our garden, Holly. There's a buku. There's a bunch of them in your garden that you want or you want to have in your garden. We're going to tackle eight of them here. And we'll start out with the most popular one, which would be ladybugs. Yep, ladybugs, um, they eat a lot of things, mostly aphids, white flies, fleas, and the Colorado potato beetle and a lot of people have ish major issues with those so that's definitely something that you want to you want to have in your garden um they can consume more than five thousand aphids during their lifetime and they live about three years so that's a lot of aphids now you, there's some ways you can bring them in now people will often buy ladybugs and release them in the garden however that doesn't mean that they're going to stay in the garden uh, when you release them in your garden? No, there's different theories that you can release them in the evening. You do it after you've watered the plants. That way they they generally stay. There's no guarantee, though. So one thing you could do is you could plant plants or flowers or what have you that attract the ladybugs, and that includes anything from dill, dandelion, um, yellow fern leaf, a flower called basket of gold, and then... Um, common yarrow and all of these things will attract the ladybugs so that that's one thing that you can do and you know you if you can keep them in by natural by bringing them in they're more uh capable of staying rather than just buying them from the online supplier and then just releasing them into your 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 garden so nat- nature providing them is is the best solution uh the next one is another most popular one which is the pollinating the the bee the bumblebee or the honeybee sure the bee so the bees do pollinate a lot of plants a number of plants to help the growth of the plants so yeah, they, they pollinate. I mean, you, pretty self-explanatory what the bee does, yeah. <laughs> right. So you can you can attract the bees by planting a variety of, there's a lot of bee, bee mix, seed mixes out there that you can purchase. You can attract them that way. You can make a little bead bath. And what the way you make the bead, bee bath is you take some rocks, like little small rocks, put them in a shallow dish, put water in that dish, and that way they have a place to land and they can drink the water and that attracts them. 
And then obviously just, um, providing them something to want to pollinate. And, and we've really never ever done a bee flower bed. Uh, we've got a number of flowering plants, the, the peppers, the eggplants, the tomatoes. Yes, they are self pollinating, but the bees go in there and pollinate and cucumbers. They come in by the groves to pollinate the cucumbers that we have growing in our garden. So a very popular, um, easy, an, uh, insect to, to bring in. So worms, worms are amazing. Not, they're not necessarily a, a bug, but they are very worthy of this list. Yes. So worms are an amazing creature. They aerate the soil. They break down organic matter. And then when they break down that organic matter, they add compost to the soil or their own worm waste. Um, worm, what are they called? Worm castings. Worm castings. Um, they do move. They, so they, they produce. Up to, a th- is it an eighth of their pound? Yes. An eighth of a pound of waste per year, which is a lot if you think about it for one little worm. And then also, they circulate the soil, the organic matter from eight feet down. So that that's the worms. Now, praying mantises, it depends on the geographical area that you're in, but they are very popular in the southern areas. Um, they can eat a variety of prey, uh, ranging from caterpillar, caterpillars, moths, to beetles, to gnats, and even crickets. Uh, they are they're attracted by tall grass, shrubs, marigolds, dill, cosmos. Uh, we had them very popular, uh, v- very frequently in the garden where I was uh, grew up in southern Illinois. And you can buy the eggs and have them hatch uh, pretty much anywhere, but based on the conditions of how cold your winter is, they may not sustain the life and you have to, to bring them back. Uh, the next year. So oh. now, so now we have, um, yeah, so mantis are interesting. I've never seen one. I don't think myself, they don't, they don't grow here. Um, so spiders are another one and they can eat and they're good for your home too, but they can eat bed bugs, aphids, roaches, in the garden, they'll eat grasshoppers, mosquitoes, and fruit flies. Definitely something you want in the garden. You don't want to try to get them out if you see spider webs. Right. No, you want to work sure. around them. Yeah, and so they like the tall, like taller plants, um, possibly even trellises, because that way they have a way to weave. So if they want to weave a web, they want to have like a two, you know, two points so that they can they can weave that web. Uh, soldier beetles. Uh, they eat grasshoppers, eggs, aphids, soft-bodied insects. Attracted by goldenrod, zinnias, marigolds, and uh, lindered trees. Um, so those are very beneficial. Uh, and the soldier beetle does not damage plants and it cannot, and it doesn't harm humans. So that's even a bigger bonus. Another one is the ground beetle. This is an interesting uh, bug to have in your garden. So yeah, they prey on, they prey on a lot of stuff. Um, looks like some sort of wormy stuff here, slug, uh, slugs. Caterpillars, ants. People have ants. This yeah. would be and, and and Colorado potato beetle. That's another one. Yep. And then cutworms, and those can be a problem. They like the more scent flowers, so that would include evening primrose, amaranthus, and clover. And they're typically active only at night. Uh, if you are fortunate enough to have clover in your yard, you will see some activity of these uh, specific uh, animal or the bugs. And, you know, keep in mind that we mentioned all of these. There are ways in which you can purchase these and bring into your property. However, disclaimer, make sure that the your municipality, your state, your region, fill in the blank, that it is legal for you to actually do such because there are some uh, restrictions on what certain... Some certain states, yeah, uh, they don't well, want wow. you yeah. bringing in... Certain insects or whatever because company A will sell you anything. Right. It's your responsibility to follow the, the laws that are set forth to, um, either release or not release. Right. Uh, let's talk about the eighth one here, Holly. The pirate bugs. I'm not super familiar with these, but they are interesting. So they eat spider mites. They'll eat insect eggs, caterpillars, aphids, and then thrip. Thrip are a, a type of, um, aphid, lychee kind of bug. Um, all, all of these bugs are eating the insects that devastate a lot of our crops. Yeah, for sure. That's why they're they're beneficial. Um, they're attracted to caraway, fennel, alfalfa, uh, spearmint, and then goldenrod. And so, if you, you usually know if you have goldenrod in your garden because that's something that you might be allergic to. It's a common allergen. Um, but they do they whether they're immature 
or adult, they do prey on those insects. And and keep in mind that dill is this dill is a very popular attractive uh, attractive plant for these insects but dill can be very invasive if you allow it to go to seed even a few plants uh we fought that in the front yard and continue to fight it in the front yard and they were in containers about nine years ago and we continue to have hundreds if not thousands of plants come up because that we let a lot of stuff go to seed and we didn't catch other stuff so dill also can is labeled an invasive species in some uh states in the in the in america so beware of that so there's eight really good beneficial insects here that you want in your garden. Yeah. So thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to our show. This is our 14th show of 2020. Did you miss last week's show? We talked about mulching and mulches, four proven slug control methods, and our guest was Jill Mashihi. You can listen to that show by going to your favorite podcast platform and searching the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast, or we can make it. we will make it even easier for you to send it to you. Send us an email to... Garden Talk Radio at gmail.com. And in the show line, put show 14, and we will send you the link. We will be right back. Do not go anywhere. We'll be talking about gardening with pets. You are listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, a program to help you grow better, maintain your garden, grow a better garden landscape, help your trees grow better, make that grass look greener, and preserving what you grow for indoor and out. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. If you love growing tomatoes, then you've got to try Tomato Secret by Dr. Jim. At the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, we stand behind Tomato Secret and recommend it to all gardeners who would easily like to grow higher quality tomatoes with more color, more flavor, and less bugs and disease. Tomato Secret is specifically designed to grow high quality tomatoes that is made with 12 natural ingredients so pure that you can feed it to a cow. Simply apply one cup in the hole at planting and sprinkle one cup around the plant after one month. That is all it takes for the best tomatoes on earth. With this product, you do not have to guess what is wrong with your tomato plant because it has everything your plants need to be healthy and produce the most delicious fruit. You'll never grow tomatoes the same again. Grow the largest, juiciest, and most delicious tomatoes on earth. To find out more about Tomato Secret and other products, visit drjims.com. That's D-R-J-I-M-Z dot com. Seed Savers Exchange has been saving, preserving, and sharing heirloom seeds since 1975, and today continues to provide those seeds to gardeners just like you. With 600-plus varieties offered in this year's catalog and 18,000 listings on their exchange, their gardener-to-gardener seed swap, Seed Savers Exchange is keeping cherished seed varieties alive. Visit SeedSavers.org to request a free catalog or to purchase seeds online for this year's growing season. That's SeedSavers.org. Looking to kill weeds without using dangerous chemicals like glyphosate? An all-natural weed killer may be just what you're looking for. Green Gobbler's Vinegar Weed Killer is a concentrated herbicide derived naturally from corn. It's four times stronger than regular table vinegar, so it packs a punch against all kinds of pesky weeds. Use Green Gobbler's Vinegar Weed Killer to safely kill dandelions, crabgrass, clover, ivy, and more. It's perfect for driveways, pavers, fence lines, and other outdoor surfaces. Green Gobbler Vinegar Weed Killer is an effective and powerful herbicide, but it doesn't stop there. It's also certified for organic use, so when used properly, it won't negatively affect soil or wildlife. Since Green Gobbler's Vinegar Weed Killer is pure vinegar with no other additives, pet owners can let their pets out to play right after application. Search for Green Gobbler Vinegar Weed Killer on Amazon.com today. We offer a hassle-free money-back guarantee, so you have nothing to lose. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Trim Bin turns any chair into a workstation. Comfortably sort your herbs, dried flowers, cannabis, and more. Easily collect pollen with the static brush and mirror finish collection tray. High walls keep your work contained. To get yours, visit harvest-more.com. Made in California. Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit ivyorganics.com. The Simply Solar Greenhouse is a one-piece molded fiberglass greenhouse that is easy to install and maintain. Multiple sizes available. Check them all out at migreenhouse.com. 
Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. Responsible watering, accurate, fast, and efficient. Earth conscious. Visit waterhoop.com. Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mel's also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mel's today. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Phylum Bioproducts, Spartan Mosquito, Dr. Jim's, Nasala Kabucha, MI Greenhouse LLC, Green Gobbler, Water Hoop, Seed Savers Exchange. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Well, do you garden with a pet? Is your pet chickens? Are they dogs? Are they cats? Do you have a pet donkey? Whatever the case is, it's beneficial. Maybe somebody has a pet donkey. We don't know. That's fine. I just don't, you know, we're kind of gearing towards the more um, the, cat, cats the, the and more dogs common, here. I guess, quotation mark, uh, more familiar pets. Uh, I don't know if you had a pet donkey, if you'd let them in the garden. Maybe, maybe they're pulling the plow. Maybe they're pulling the plow. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, uh, gardening with your pets is very beneficial. Not only, uh, it, it's I guess to a level, it's therapeutical uh, when it comes to bringing them in the garden. But there are some things we need to be aware of. We just you shouldn't just let them go roaming around. Right. So there are some parallels between having a pet and gardening because one is it helps it helps lower your it helps strength it actually helps strengthen your immune system having a pet also gardening. And then another one is is that it lowers your heart rate, lowers your blood pressure. So both of these those, are all studies that's been done. Yeah, so I mean a pet and or gardening are so there's some parallels there. There's benefits to both. Um, petting a pet like a dog or a cat very calming. It's proven also that the vibrational purrs of a cat are calming. So yeah, that's um, for that's, you and the cat. For you and the cat, yeah. yes. And then when you give them treats afterwards, they're very happy. So what are what are some things we need to be aware of if we've got a dog, we've got a cat, we've got other pets in, uh, that when we take them out in the garden here? I mean, some of, this, thing, yeah. some of this may be common, but there's other things that we need to bear. Cats and dogs like to chew on plants, right? and there's some that are not safe for them. No. So one thing is you want to be aware of where your pet is. So if you have a large yard, you let your pets roam around, that's fine. But sometimes maybe... A lot of times you'll get mushrooms, right? Some people get mushrooms, wild mushrooms in their yard. Maybe you don't want your dog or cat eating those if they're prone to eating those. So if you're in a climate that that happens or near that time of year, check your yard. Check your yard for anything that might be foreign, new, whatever that could be harmful. And the mushrooms are a good sign that you have very healthy soil, but they can be toxic to the animals if consumed so you can always just knock them down with a rake whether in right. raised beds or your containers or in the yard themselves yeah so that's just part of being aware where right. is your pet and right. th- that also comes in hand with a lot of these things one is lilies are toxic to cats so if you have lilies and you have a cat that likes to chew on plants that's not a good idea now the the, the reason why and i'm not a veterinarian i just farm kid the cats would eat grass because they were wanting to Regurgitate. Regurgitate, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. But so it, if they're consuming that toxicity, they're, it's going to be worse than just a regurgitation, I believe. And many cats like to eat plants, mm-hmm. so it's a, it's a thing. Um, you want to be mindful of thorny plants. So if you have thorny plants and you have an animal that just runs through everything, you want to be mindful of that, that they could get scraped up. 
Also, so. also kids, you know, our niece and nephew, they're pricklies, they're pricklies. So they always want to run around barefoot in the backyard, and there is a number of those. The that, thistles. The thistles, yeah. yeah. Now, we had, growing up, we had Hosteins that would eat the thistles just like it was grass. Now, that's a side story, but, yeah, you'd feed them, and they'd just eat it just like it was a bale of hay type of thing. You'd throw the thistles out. It didn't matter what they were. They'd just eat them. So, yeah, fun fact there. Fun fact. What, what um, else should we uh, be aware of when we have our pets in the garden with us? Make sure any harmful tools, toxic garden supplies, chemicals, 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 yes, tools, yeah, that they don't have access to those. Especially cats. Cats will jump on stuff. You got a shed. You have a tool hanging off a shelf or something. The cat jumps on the shelf. It could be dangerous. So make sure you have those tools secured. Um, same thing with dogs. Dogs might pick up a tool in their mouth. Whatever. So. Definitely think about that. Just and, and you talk about the chemicals. There, some cats are attracted to very potent chemicals, yeah. and they would like they like lick, lick the bottle if they can. Right. So that's another thing is thinking about that. Or some dogs just don't know, and they'll eat anything. Right. And, and talking about dogs, let's talk about mulch, especially chocolate mulch. Yeah, uh, that cocoa mulch. Yeah. If you have dogs, not a good idea. They're going to want to eat it. It is. Cho- it is a cocoa chocolate base. And chocolate is toxic to and us. Some, and some gardeners do not like to use that simply because it molds very quickly um, and causes other problems in addition to the, the smell. It smells very wonderful, but you've got animals and, you know, or and, uh, eating that kind of thing. Uh, very, very bad for them. Uh, provide plenty of shade uh, for your animals as well as you. Let's not neglect ourselves in the garden. Uh, we need to stay hydrated as well as the pets do. Yeah, for sure. You want to make sure that they have some water out there as you, plenty of shade, especially in hot days. If if you need a break, they probably need a break and, and vice they're, versa. They're going to need it because they're probably going a full <laughs> bore all the time. Oh, yeah, for sure. So if you if you take a break, make sure you bring them, whether it be in the house or the shade or, you know, lay down, whatever whatever you want to do. Just make sure that they, they take the break too. Uh, woody areas, uh, if you've got a lot of that area in your, in your backyard or nearby, fleas and ticks are something you need to, uh, fleas is a little more undetectable on an animal versus a tick, uh, but they do make flea collars, uh, but you do want to be aware of that, not only for your, your pets, but for you, ticks can carry diseases that, uh, can affect humans, uh, very, Lyme disease is still a thing, so be aware of that. Another thing is, is that, um, you want to know your garden and what might be toxic to your pets. So we just, we talked about this with the lilies and cats do, they'll eat, they'll eat grass or whatever plants. If some cats will just eat it, not all cats, but some will. And there's a lot of stuff that can be very toxic, such as one is called you, um, the holly plant tulips. Now we have tulips and we have a, a house roaming cat and he doesn't bother the tulips. He's just more interested in the grass. But you never know. Um, azaleas, pal- certain palms, certain mums, poinsettia, that's a huge one, English ivy and rhododendrons. So if you maybe just move somewhere, maybe something, some plant pops up, it's your first spring, figure out what that is before you just let your pet go roaming around your yard. Keep the, the pets out of the compost bin. If you have an enclosed compost bin or a tumbler, this is uh, not applicable to you. But open open pits or compost on the ground or wherever that may be, they will like to use that as a litter box. Now and you, you also want to keep them from... And, and that's not what you want. Because, right, you wanna, you but know. you don't want to put their litter in your... You don't want to put their litter or their waste in your compost. Right. And you also, if they create waste in your garden for some reason, you want to scoop that out. Uh, because that is, uh, there's a term there that I'm blanking on, but that because they're the bacteria. Yeah, there you go. Uh, it it can be detrimental to you if consumed, even if it's just on a leaf or a a, a piece of fruit type of thing. So keep that in mind. Uh, what else we need to be aware of here? So gravel um, can be hard, especially if when large large paw dogs have those larger gaps in the pads of their feet. So gravel can get lodged in there. Also, that's the, kind of the thistle p- time of that thing. That too. Yeah. So if you if your pet roams around and you're concerned, you can always just check their paws before they come in. They the have little booties now you yeah. can put on your pets they you know, do. if you want to be that type of uh, pet owner. Right. And, and, and it's a lot of be- – and here's the other thing. It's not just to keep the gravel from getting – when they run on hot pavement or uh, astroturf, yeah. it will blister their feet. So that's it's, another thing. If yeah. you have a lot of pavement or some sort of hot 
Um, the AstroTurf, yeah. yeah. That's not good for them either. Uh, very beneficial for the bottoms of the paws or the pads of the dogs there. And yeah, I ensure you and your dogs are, and your cats and whomever else is out there is consuming plenty of water. Uh, there is a gardener, and some of you may follow him, uh, the Hort Channel or Shane, Sean James Coleman uh, over in the U.K. Do a little, but do it often is his phrase, and that goes a lot. Uh, a lot of, you know, relations to gardening. Do a little bit, but do it often. Do a lot, you know, that type of thing. Right. And it just, just in general, you know, if you're working your garden. Typically, you're a, not on a farm. Uh, it's a hot day. Right. You but, but there's. Take your breaks. We're, we're in a lot of farm country and I grew up on a farm and I know what it's like. Go, go, go faster, harder, quicker, get it done. But this is different when you're in the backyard type of situation. Yeah. It is different when you're in the backyard. Maybe you should learn that lesson for yourself, Joey. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, you definitely want to take breaks. And that's one thing, especially when it's hot. If it's hot, maybe don't garden during the peak hours of the day and then save that for the morning, evening, wait a day, whatever you, whatever you need to do. Well, speaking of the heat of the day, now that the temperatures have warmed up and you want to protect your garden from various beetles, weevils, boars, and yes, those Japanese beetles are making their way back to your garden. And what a better way to prevent those pests from destroying your garden than by controlling them while they are larvae. grub gone is an easy-to-apply granular product that can be spread on your turf to successfully control grub invaders. Developed by Phylum Bioproducts from a naturally occurring bacteria, Grub Gone is a non-chemical BT product that specifically targets only certain scarab pests and is safe to use around bees and other beneficial insects. Yes, and if you're already got those beetles flying around in your yard, Beetle Gone is an organic water dispersible powder that can be sprayed directly onto your edible plants. To find more information out about all the products that Phylum Bioproducts has, Go to phylumbioproducts.com. That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M bioproducts.com. Do not go anywhere. I know you won't, but I'm going to ask you to hang around. Author Linda Lee will be with us right after the break. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, a program to help your garden grow better. You can bet the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener's phone lines are always jammed during the show. So Joey and Holly keep their phone lines open 24-7 to help you. Call anytime, 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-7469. Or just remember, 1-800-927-SHOW. S-H-O-W. Leave a message and they will call you back. Planting conditions are always favorable with the Power Planter Earth Auger. No matter what the job is, Power Planter has the right size for you. Simply attach to a drill and let the Power Planter do the work for you, creating holes fast and efficiently with ease. Find the size that fits your project at PowerPlanter.com. Dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position. Step, twist, pull, and plant. Visit ProPlugger.com. Tree Ripe Citrus Company has top quality produce that comes right to your neighborhood with the freshest peaches and blueberries you'll find. To find locations, go to tree-ripe.com. Do not settle for the rest when you can have the best peaches and blueberries with Tree Ripe Citrus Company. Go to tree-ripe.com. Deer Defeat is an all-natural repellent to keep deer, rabbits, and groundhogs away from your precious plants. Deer Defeat protects your plants day and night dries clear and odorless it will not clog your sprayer deer defeat works for 30 days through rain snow and freeze safe effective and works on rabbits money back guarantee to purchase go to deerdefeat.com and use code radio to save 10 percent on your order deer defeat it can't be beat The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed-starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants. To multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raised beds, RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Use coupon code TWVG at checkout and get 10% off your entire order. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Hello, gardeners. It's Ann from Neptune's Harvest Organic Fertilizers in Gloucester, Mass., 
If you're planting flowers, vegetables, shrubs, or just trying to keep your lawn healthy and green, then you should know about Neptune's Harvest. Neptune's Harvest fertilizers come from the mineral-rich North Atlantic Ocean, which contains all the nutrients plants and soil need. Flower growers, get your sunglasses out. You'll want to use them when you're looking at how bright those colors are. Vegetable growers, with Neptune's Harvest, you can achieve the amazing results you deserve for all your efforts. You'll have the most abundant, sweet-tasting supply of organically grown produce. And there's nothing like the taste of a fresh garden tomato you grew yourself. Neptune's Harvest works so great, whether you know what you're doing or not, you'll look good and you'll feel good because you're doing the right thing for the environment and your health. Try Neptune's Harvest products from the ocean to set your plants in motion. Available at your local garden center and to learn more, go to NeptunesHarvest.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Make watering easy. DripWorks provides quality drip irrigation supplies and equipment to gardeners just like you for all your growing needs across the U.S. and Canada. Purchase online at DripWorks.com. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Neptune Harvest, Happy Leaf LED, Dripworks, We Grow Indoors, Deer Defeat, Harvest More, Blue Ribbon Organics, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center, Chip Drop. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center is the place for all Milwaukeeans to go. Whether you need bulk material, whether you need native plants, vegetables, herbs, flowers, containers, whatever it is, landscaping uh, consultations, lawn care, they've got it all. Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center at 4930 West Loomis Road, just off of Layton in Greenfield. You can give them a call at 414-282-4220. You can also visit them online at bluemills.com. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. I appreciate you staying and hanging around. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for the week. Linda Lee is a plant lover, passionate road tripper, and cookbook author whose savvy advice and best-selling books have been featured in Time, Outside, and Food and Wine. She has a website full of garden info at GardenBetty.com. So we are curious why your website is t- titled Garden Betty, and your name is Linda. <laughs> Well, I started my blog back in 2010, and I was living in Southern California at the time. I also surfed and snowboarded a lot, along with gardening as my passions. So down there, a common nickname for a girl who's into the extreme sports world is a Betty. So when it came time to think of a name for my blog, I combined Garden and Betty to come up with a name that was actually available not knowing that it would later become a brand, and the name has just stuck with me. One of those stories that um, not everybody knows the secrets behind. Yeah, this is how <laughs> this is how brands are made, or these very strange behind-the-scenes. Eh. <laughs> well, you're a fan of the Florida weave trellising method that people use for tomatoes, as we are uh, as well. What is the Florida weave for people who are not familiar, and why do you use it, and how do you construct yours? What kind of material do you make yours out of? So the Florida weave is a method of staking your tomato plants, and I really love it because it uses materials that are very easy to find. They're inexpensive, and it's quick to erect. It also doesn't require any storage space at the end of the season. What you do is take two stakes and you place them on either side of your tomato plants, or you could have two or three tomatoes between your two stakes. And then what you do is you take a length of twine, a heavy duty twine, and you sandwich your plants in between the twine, um, in between the, um, 
you sandwich the plants in between the twine, just running them back and forth between each stake. So as the plants grow taller, you just add another row of twine on top of the one before that. So you're technically weaving the plants in a figure eight pattern to hold them upright as they grow up. My favorite materials to use for the floor to weave is to take uh, steel fence T-posts because they're thin, but they're extremely sturdy. They're at the perfect height. Usually I get the seven or eight foot tall T-posts. Um, and then you can just strike it into the ground about a foot, maybe two feet, depending on you know how windy your weather is. And when you use a twine, say a tomato twine or a hemp twine, which is my preference because it's very durable, um, those materials can last several seasons. And so you don't, they don't get rusty. You don't have to keep replacing them. So it's very efficient. And, and because of the Florida weave, we find you can pack a few more tomatoes in an area versus the cages that kind of take up the space that you, the spacing is a little tighter on the, the Florida weave tomatoes in the cages. Do you find that or do you still keep the spacing relatively the same depending on the method? I do space my tomatoes smaller, so I typically have a 4 by 8 raised bed, which is how I grow most of my plants, and I can actually fit six indeterminate tomato plants in that space using two Florida weave trellises, so it's two rows of the Florida weave. Um, that leaves about 18 inches between each plant, and I find that it's plenty. They actually grow over 8 feet tall every year. Yeah, they're definitely um, very helpful trellis. Now, aphids are the ticks of the garden world. We're always talking about them. What are so? What are your best tips for um, dealing with aphids, controlling aphids, r- ridding yourself of aphids? Yeah, aphids are a big challenge in the garden. I see them most often in the beginning of the season and at the end of the season, and it's usually a response to some kind of plant stress. And that's why they show up. So. I feel that the best way to prevent aphids from happening in the first place is to catch an infestation early because once the numbers multiply, it's almost impossible to treat your plant. Um, A fun little fact is that all of the aphids in spring and summer are females and they can lay eggs and produce more. um, They give live birth without the use of a male. and So they can produce many, many generations of aphids all at once. Uh, and that's why they explode <laughs> seemingly overnight. Yeah, uh, uh, kind of evil type of bug whenever that uh, that type of thing occurs, yeah. <laughs> so if you see, you know, a few kind of straggling on your leaves, my suggestion is to always pick off that leaf immediately and then toss it into your trash because you don't want them to continue reproducing and possibly affecting your other plants. So inspect your plants early and often and get rid of any of the leaves that are infected. Um, That can reduce your chances of an invasion pretty well. If you miss them because they do like to hide on the undersides of leaves or like deep in the rosettes of plants like broccoli, um, a good way to remove them is to just get a a garden hose and blast them with a strong jet of water. So that kind of dislodges them from the leaves and that works really well. Um, you know, but you do have to keep applying the water, I would say two or three times a week until the population is diminished. And if that fails, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, then I usually resort to an insecticidal soap and I make that at home, um, using just, uh, plain, um, castle soap and, water and an essential oil to help repel the insects, usually a peppermint or eucalyptus or lavender. And And then you can apply that right on the aphids and that actually um, affects their exoskeletons. It effectively kills them. And and this year we, we've found, and, and maybe you have seen the same thing, there's a lot of new gardeners that are trying to garden for the very first time for a vast variety of reasons. And we always encourage people that, you know, hey, you're going to have bug problems. You're going to have plants that die. It's not a failure. It's a learning experience because you as well as Holly and myself, we are learning every day and we do this for a living uh, when it comes to the gardening world. Yeah, and sometimes... 
aphids, I feel like, you know, everybody thinks of them as the bad bug because they are so destructive and they can pretty much wipe out your entire crop. But some, you know, when you look at the good side of things, they actually tell you that something is off balance in your garden so that you can take action somewhere else. So maybe it's not diverse enough and you need to introduce more flowers to attract more of the beneficial insects to your garden. Maybe you're underwatering, maybe you're overwatering. You're creating some sort of stress in the environment and that's why the aphids show up. So if you can get to the root of the problem, you know, not just get rid of the aphids, but find out why your irrigation isn't working and shade your plants if there's just too much sunlight and too much heat on them. Uh, maybe you're applying too much nitrogen. So all of these factors um, are things to look at trying oh. to prevent aphids. Okay. So um, now we love growing garlic and many of us may not always know when it's time to harvest, um, especially when it comes to something like a hard neck versus a soft neck. What are some good tips that you have learned to determine when to harvest garlic? For me, it's all in the leaves. The best way to tell when you need to harvest garlic is just to look at the amount of green leaves versus brown or dead leaves that are on the plant. Depending on the garlic variety, your harvest period can be anywhere between May and August. It also depends on when you planted them and where your region is, whether you're in like a northern or southern. So leaves are the most reliable indicator. They start dying from the bottom. And as the weeks go on through late spring to summer, um, each row, you know, like each set of lower leaves will continue to brown and wilt and they'll just continue dying off bit by bit. When you see that about half of the leaves have died off, then that's a good time to check your garlic. And you just dig a little bit um, into the soil, check out the size of the bulb to see if it's like a good hefty size. And if it is, you can pull it if you feel like it should have another week or two to keep growing, then you just mow the swell back on and then keep watching the leaves. But you definitely don't want, say, 75% of the leaves or all of the leaves to die off because at that point, it's too late to harvest. I understand. Now, we're seeing this very prevalent in the southern garden area, and uh, we get a lot of questions about blossom end rot, which is one of the most common problems that people will face with their tomato plants. Uh, what are some things, what are some tips that, you can offer for people who are dealing with this problem, and that is the the fruit that is ripe, but when you harvest it, it's black and rotten on the bottom portion of it. Yeah, so the first thing I would tell people is that even though it's unsightly on the bottom, if the rest of the tomato has grown perfectly normally, you can actually cut off that sunken spot and then eat the part of the tomato that's um, – not disfigured because it's actually, it's a disfigurement. It's a physiological condition. So it's not infected by bacteria. It's not from fungi. That's not diseased in any way. Um, it just looks ugly. And the reason why that happens is because the plant is unable to use the calcium from the soil effectively. And that's what causes that sunken spot. Usually it happens with the first flush of the season because the plant is just getting its bearings and reproducing um, and that tends to resolve itself, you know, as the season goes on. But what makes it more, um, what makes it more likely to happen is when people use a little bit too much nitrogen in the beginning because they encourage this big flush of foliage, um, to grow and grow and grow. When you have that many leaves, um, the fruit don't really have a chance to catch up, you know, and grow to like a good size. And the leaves end up taking all of the calcium for themselves, leaving very little for the fruit. And that's why they get blossom and rot. Um, one of the common misconceptions is that people think blossom and rot is due to not having enough calcium in the soil. But in truth, most garden soil, especially if you've grown a lot of plants in it before, that has a sufficient amount of soil, but the plant is just not able to use that soil and pull it up. You know, it needs a good amount of water and a good consistent moisture to be able to circulate the calcium throughout the leaves and throughout the fruits. So a good way to make sure that you don't get blossom and rot is to be consistent with your watering. You know, you don't want to let it go through periods of drought 
You definitely don't want to overwater it because tomatoes don't like having too much water. You just want to give it a good deep soaking once, maybe twice a week, depending on how hot it is. Well, before we let you go, I want to ask you about seed starting mix. Where Many people have already started their seeds. They've got them in the ground. And sooner or later here, these garden centers will have potting mixes on sale because they're trying to clean out inventory. Would you advise gardeners of any level to purchase those potting soil mixes and then just store them in the garage or basement so they're ready to go next year? Or is it best to buy new product, new potting soil uh, in the January or the early portions of the growing season, the, the, the coming growing season? What, what would you advise people on that? Generally, if you're buying a good basic potting mix, it doesn't really have a shelf life. As long as you keep it dry and you store it in a good place, you can continue to use that year after year. The only time that I would caution people from buying any kind of potting mix on discount is if they claim to have like live microbials or any of these special um, enhancements in the soil because, you know, any kind of um, microbial or, you know, is not going to continue to live, especially if you're storing it in a hot garage or a hot shed. Um, um, good, good advice to have there. Well, we greatly appreciate you taking time with us, uh, Linda. How can people find out more about you? Where can they go and find your 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 books uh, and your website? So they can find out more about me at gardenbuddy dot com, which is my blog. I talk about edible gardening, urban homesteading, farm to table cooking, raising chickens. I also have a new book out called The No Waste Vegetable Cookbook, which helps you save money on the food that you grow or buy. And it teaches you how to use up all of the parts of the vegetables that you never knew you could eat. So this is especially fun for gardeners who ever wondered if you could eat, say, tomato leaves or zucchini shoots or cucumber shoots. And there's recipes for all of that in my book. And on social media, you can find me at Garden Betty. Well, Linda, we greatly appreciate the time and the knowledge not only that you've shared with Holly and myself, but all of our listeners from across the country. I appreciate you having me. Well, thank you for that. And do not go anywhere. When we come back, it's going to be your garden questions and our garden answers. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show program to help your garden grow better. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Ship Drop is a website you can sign up for free wood chip mulch delivery right to your door. For free, Ship Drop connects homeowners and gardeners with tree services who are trying to get rid of their wood chips. You can also sign up to get free logs and firewood. Go to ShipDrop.com to learn more and sign up for a free account. World's Coolest Rain Gauge.com. Need I say more? Oh, yeah. What you say? You say Nasala Kombucha. It'll put some glide in your stride and some pep in your step. Nasala Kombucha. (laughs) Yeah. Nasala Kombucha makes your body happy. Nasala Kombucha makes your body smile. For all your indoor growing needs, equipment, and supplies, it's WeGrowIndoors.com. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. The new way to support your tomatoes, wrap it and snap it, tomatosnaps.com. Tired of breaking your back while pulling weeds? Worrying about spraying chemicals around plants you want to keep? Chapin has the solution with the Weed Devil. The Chapin Weed Devil is a compact, lightweight, long-handled weed-killing machine. Powered with a rechargeable battery, you can start spraying with the touch of a button. Just choose your favorite herbicide, fill the tank, and spot spray as needed. To order the Chapin Weed Devil, visit www.chapinmfg.com. Conserve water, save time, reduce runoff, eco-friendly. Visit waterhoop.com. 
When it comes to bulk landscaping materials, Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center is where everyone goes. Whatever the project, we have the materials you need with over 40 varieties to choose from. Soils, mulches, gravels, decorative stones, fresh cut sod. Blue Mills has these products in stock and ready for easy pickup or fast delivery. So what are you waiting for? Now is the time to get your yard back into shape. Stop in and pick these materials up or call us for delivery today. Nobody does bulk landscaping materials better than Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Power Planter Earth Augers, Ivy Organics, Root Maker, Pomona Universal Pectin, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Pro Plugger, Tomato Snaps, World's Coolest Floating Rain Gauge. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. It's time to answer some of the questions that you have submitted over the last week. If you've got a question, you can certainly do such uh, by getting a hold of us at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-SHOW. Or you can email us at gardentalkradio at gmail.com, and we will get an answer to your question. Holly, we've got several questions. What would be the first one we should tackle today? Uh, so my coworker, Deanna, she wanted to know, she said, my tomatoes have purplish-looking leaves. What can you do to help? What can I do to help? And so, t- uh, purplish tomato. Well, first of all, where are they planted at? What, what situation? So she went? has raised beds. Okay. Um, and I know she has a raised bed mix in there. I don't know how old it is. I did not ask her that. But, um, she has raised beds and so she has this issue. And I said that that's a lack of phosphorus and you can use, uh, blood mill. Mm-hmm. And so sh- I told her. Bone, where- bone, uh, bone mill. Yeah. Bone, yeah, bone mill. mill. You said Sorry. blood mill. It, it's, and I told, it, it's and the second number on the bag of fertilizer is what it's lacking. Right. Now, we've had purple leaves on our tomatoes when we transplanted them. We had a lack of uh, phosphorus in the seed starting mix in which we start our tomatoes. If they were recently put in the bed, that should absorb the nutrients in the soil and that way they will come out of it. Now, there are some varieties that do contain a purple tint a lot of the time through their growing cycle, through their lives. Right. Now, um, yeah, so she was grateful for that, and she, um, I told her where she could buy it locally, and then she was going to, to do that. So that's cool. Um, so here's another question we have: Is I have a tree peony growing with a regular peony? I would like to take out the regular peony, but I don't want to hurt the tree peony. Is it possible? I really only care about the tree peony. It has somewhat nice after the tree. It is somewhat nice after the tree peony blooms. I get the regular peony flower. It just started happening a year or a year or so ago. Now the tree peony is much more valuable when you look at it. Here's what you can do. Uh, if you've got those two in combination, typically you would just dig one up, uh, the, the, the bush one or the, the non tree one and throw it away. But since they're growing together and we are in the midst of the, the blooming season, here's what you can do. Uh, cut back and cut to the ground the bush peony and leave the tree one alone. What this will do is prevent the bush from getting the sunlight and begin to stress out the roots of that uh, the bush peony. And by the end of the season, if you continue to trim it back, you probably won't have to dig it up. It will probably die on its own, leaving the tree peony all by itself and putting it in the position that you want it to be isolated by itself, and that was the one you wanted to keep anyway. But do not dig it up because you're going to disrupt and possibly kill both of these uh, if they're intertwined the way that you uh, seem to describe that they being. All right, so another one is, what is your best advice for getting rid of ground squirrels slash chipmunks that keep burrowing under my daylilies, red buds, walk rock walls? Um, I don't want to harm them. But we have a dog. 
that that seems yeah. that seems to catch them and bring them occasionally to the front back door. Well, uh, chipmunk squirrels absolutely cannot stand the smell of certain strong oils like peppermint, citrus, cinnamon, and eucalyptus. So you can spray around the areas where the chipmunks are located, and they can't stand the smell. They also can't stand the smell of garlic, uh, pepper, peppered base uh, repellent. So uh, if you find their hole or you can find where they're at, you can apply um, you can apply that to the area. However, it's not, you will have to reapply it after each rain. Uh, mothballs will determine chipmunks, uh, and squirrels. But if, if uh, the mothballs are eaten by the chipmunks, uh, it can kill them. Also, with the dog being there, that may not be something that you would want to have open to the environment. The dog may get a hold of it as well. Uh, sprinkle some cayenne chili powder. Uh, around the hottest uh, that you can get, uh, and you will have to reapply that the next time it rains as well. But it's non-toxic, um, and they get it in their nose, and they don't like it. So you can discourage the chipmunks from hanging around your place uh, by doing that. Now, a, de- a decoy or a predator, uh, like an owl or something, can scare the chipmunks away, but chipmunks are pretty smart, and once they see after about four days that owl has not moved, it, it may not be the most uh, effective uh, way. Uh, Holly got a canning question here. They want to know how many pounds of vegetables and or fruit, based on what they're canning, is needed to can. Uh, is there some type of canning chart, or do you have some general knowledge of the, gen- the, the basics yeah. amount? So um, the National Center for Home Food Preservation website has all of this information on it. Again, that's the National Center for home food preservation, and it will say, I have X amount of whatever, and I want to can this. How many pounds do I need per quart, per jar, what have you? Um, for D- I, Just some references here. What, yeah, what for would reference, you say? Um, per quart, an asparagus you would want to use, and this is per pound, uh, two and a half to four and a half pounds. Beans, um, so this is like the, the snap beans or the wax beans, whatever. Pole beans. Like, uh, string beans, yeah. Um, one half to two and a half. Lima beans, three to five. One, well, it's one and a half to two and a half pounds per quart. Right. This yeah. is pounds per quart. Yep. That's what I said. Yep. Um, and then beets without the tops, two to three and a half pounds. Carrots without the tops, two to three pounds. Corn or cream style or whole corn, three to six pounds. Peas, three to six pounds. Pumpkin, one and uh, spinach. Uh, yeah, p- pumpkin, one and a half to three spinach you don't necessarily want to can spinach so that's, you can freeze it can't you yeah you can freeze it um winter squash so anything like squash winter squash pumpkin you want to cube that uh, peel it and then cube it and then tomatoes two and a half to three and a half per quart so again the national center for home food preservation has that information on their website and i guess all out of all of them you listed and and we rambled through them quite a bit if you want that information again you can go to that national Center for Home Food Preservation and get that. Um, but the, the, the tomatoes would be the most popular one, I would assume, at two and a half to three and a half pounds per quart. So true story one time. Okay. Quick, quick story. Um, our local food co-op was having this contest and the, uh, I don't know what she is, like the president of the board was like, I have X amount pounds of tomatoes. I'm going to make tomato sauce. How many quarts do you think this is going to make? And I went to the National Center for Home Food Preservation. I guess I kind of cheated, but I won. And I, I guess, is that really cheating? There was no rules that said no, you there couldn't was no look rules it up. That I yeah. couldn't, right? And I won a, a t-shirt. And I still have the t-shirt. It was probably like, I don't know, seven years ago or something. So, yeah. Uh, Chris wants to know, is there any tips on slowing the production of flowers on the basil? I had a problem with it last year. It kept going to flower and the plant would begin to shut down. So the biggest thing is, is as you see those flowers, you just want to pinch them off. And that's going to help them not produce those flowers as much. Um, and also, it, when you when the basil feels feels threatened about warm weather, it's going to put the well flowers hot in. weather. Yeah. Hot weather, not warm. Yeah, hot weather. Uh, uh, keeping the roots watered, damp, and cool will slow the uh, the quickness of those flowers. And uh, you can take big chunks of the limbs off as well as stripping the leaves. Now, again, you don't want to go completely bare with it. Otherwise, you're going to kill the plant. Um, and it will come back two or three, even four times. Now, we had a basil plant in the kitchen window 
for about a year, I guess it would have been, uh, 365 days because we, it, we hang, hung it in the window and it stayed alive. I don't know if we killed it or it died on its own, but it produced for quite some time, uh, when it come to, came to that. Uh, question number six here that we had. What are your thoughts on Wallapini Gardener? Now, Wallapini Gardening is an in, it, it's a me- method of creating essentially a greenhouse in a pit. You dig down, uh, eight or nine feet and then you create a roof over top of that. You put rafters and it's ground level where the roof is, but it's like a basement essentially. You dig a basement and that's where you garden year round and the temperature pretty much stays consistent about 55 degrees. And obviously it's not going to be that successful if you're going to do, uh, and your roof would be like a, a tarp or a, a clear, uh, translucent material. It obviously wouldn't be that great for like hot plants like cucumbers, peppers, and eggplants, but your cool weather crops, you could grow year round in that. And I think it'd be, if you have the availability to dig uh, a basement type of situation where you can plant down there, um, it would be great. It stays cool in the summer, warmer in the winter. Uh, you're below frost line, so you don't have to worry about any of that. So would be something. Now, my first my first, uh, if I had to pick, I would do like an 80 foot by 30 foot hoop house is what I would go with if the money was available, uh, to do it that way. Uh, we got another, we got a question here about, um, uh, pH level here. Um, can you speak on the shelf life of nutrients and pH up and down nutrients? I'm big in hydroponics and was gifted some uh, bottles. Okay. So, right, so pH, um, is affected by exposure to air. Yeah. Now, the pH so, is a chemical that uh, keeps that the the in the hydroponics the, yeah. the, the water neutral or up so and down, the, whatever you want. The more you open it, the more you expose it to air. The sooner it's going to expire. Um, so you want to keep that in mind. And they can last for years in a cold, dark place. So, I guess be mindful. You know, don't leave it open. Make sure you seal it tightly after you use it every time. Um, keep it in a, a cool, dark place. Don't don't put it in an area where the temperature might vary quite a bit. Um, the only exception is that ru- uh, nutrients that are inoculated with beneficial bacteria and fungi, they will last about two years. Now, this is the same thing if you have a granular fertilizer. As long as you keep it dry and cool, it'll be fine, and you can keep it in you know a, a container for years because it's a dry material. It's a mineral. In the earth, they stay there for billions of years, You've got it in a bag in your garage, your house, your your workshop, wherever that is. So the same thing applies on that. Well, we are out of time, and we certainly appreciate you tuning into the program. If you've missed any part of this program or want to revisit the entire thing, you can do that by going to our website, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com, clicking on the Season 4 tab at the top of the page, or you can send us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com and say, hey, Miss part of the show on show 14. Uh, can you send that to me? And we will do that. Uh, you can also find video links of all that we do. We do thir- uh, 12 productions a week of In Garden and In Studio. Join us next week on the program where we'll be talking about four of the most common tomato diseases and how to solve them, as well as, yeah, most of our garden, if not all of our garden is planted. But we've got five, we, at least five jobs. We're going to go over five of them that can that can and need to be done right now, as well as answering your questions. And new new author, Pam Farley, will be with us. So until next week, for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden.